Greetings, Ohio Valley. This is Dan Lima with OSU Extension from Belmont County. And this is Karen Cox from WVU Extension in Ohio County. Thanks for tuning in to Extension Calling, your source for research-based information for the farm, garden, and home. Do you have questions about the COVID-19 vaccination? Do you want to know who can get it, where to get it, or do you have general questions about COVID-19 vaccines? Vaccinate.wv.gov has the info you are looking for. You can also call the West Virginia COVID-19 Vaccine Info Line to talk to a representative and find out more at 1-833-734-0965. Again, that's V-A-C-C-I-N-A-T-E dot W-V dot gov or 1-833-734-0965 to get your COVID-19 vaccination questions answered. This message was brought to you by the WVU Extension Service. Well, it is the end of October and it is Halloween season and nothing, for me at least, nothing is scarier than a new invasive pest. And we might be staring down the barrel of one right now. Now that everybody's terrified, Karen, um, (laughs) (laughs) I guess it is Halloween. So we do have a special guest today to help us with the today's topic of scary invasives. Erica Lyon, she is the Ag and Natural Resources Educator in both Harrison and Jefferson County in Ohio. So do you want to say hello, Erica? Hi, y'all. We are very happy to have you with us today, Erica. So you've probably heard of the spotted lanternfly before. It's been in Pennsylvania for quite a while now, but it is, of course, slowly spreading as these invasive pests do. And, you know, a lot of times they just hitch a ride on our transportation systems. And you can see if you look at a map of the quarantine zones in Pennsylvania that it's just kind of walking its way, well, hitching a ride straight across I-70 And of course, where we are in the upper Ohio Valley, that means it is aimed right at us. So what we want to do today is make sure that you know what to look for, what to do if you find it, and talk about the potential impacts that this pest could have on our region. Yeah, I feel like every few years we have a new pest that comes through and they do come in different directions. As you were saying, this one is coming mainly from eastern Pennsylvania, and uh, it's kind of working its way west. I remember when that emerald ash borer came out, that started in Toledo up in northwest Ohio, and it's kind of worked its way southeast. So, Actually, it started up in Indiana, but, you know. <laughs> well, I guess if you want to go back far enough, you know, but eventually it did go through Toledo, and that's that's kind of where I started, like, looking at it and figuring out where it was coming from. Yeah. But, yeah. But either way, you got to be really careful. It's good to know what direction a pest is coming so that hopefully the counties that have the high probability of seeing it sooner can act quickly and contain it. Yeah, and I'm not I'm not sure if folks are aware, but actually October 28th is the day that the spotted lanternfly quarantine goes into effect for Ohio for the counties that do have reported infestations. So tell us a little bit about that quarantine and what that means to the people of Ohio and and in general for quarantined areas. I know that one of the things that's really important is that everyone participates in the quarantine. Because if you have someone who just doesn't care, then you get what we had with Emerald Ash Borer and it escapes the quarantine zone and wreaks havoc all around. So let's help people understand how they can help protect our region. So, yeah, the quarantine mostly addresses uh, the transportation, very much like Emerald Ash Borer did, of goods crossing state lines, county lines from infested areas to non-infested areas. Uh, the primary focus of this current quarantine is on plant uh, nursery items that might be going from place to place. But even though it's specified in this quarantine for more um, plant and nursery stock, it's still important to keep in mind that that's not the only way that spotted lanternfly travels. Um, Actually, 
it can hitchhike on vehicles. Rail cars have been of concern lately, and we actually think that's how it's primarily getting into Ohio is by trains that are passing through infested areas. So if you're visiting Jefferson County, we are currently one of the counties that is under quarantine. So we strongly recommend that you check your vehicles before leaving this area to go to an uninfested county. ODA is currently using compliance agreements. Uh, so they're not doing a full permitting system like Pennsylvania is, but essentially it's an agreement between a person who might be transporting something listed in that quarantine from an infested area to a non-infested area. And it pretty much just ensures that they're making the proper inspections to make sure that they don't have any hitchhikers. Yeah. And, and according to the Ohio Revised Code, some of that stuff includes but are not limited to, of course, because that's the way it usually reads, <laughs> live or dead trees, nursery stock, firewood, logs, perennial plants, garden plants, agricultural produce, stumps, branches, and any other products, articles, or means of conveyance that poses a reasonable risk of spreading spotted lanternfly as determined by the director. So it's a different type of quarantine that we're kind of used to coming out of COVID. Let's kind of <laughs> put that out there. What we're talking about is movement of art of products that could possibly be contaminated and facilitate the movement of that pest, even to something like your vehicle. And this is typically managed more so in the life cycle of the spotted lanternfly and how it reproduces. That's going to be very important in how it's going to move as well. Erica, do you have any information on the life cycle of the spotted lanternfly? Yeah, um, absolutely. At this time of year, we're looking at the tail end of the adults that have emerged, and it is the time of year that they would be laying eggs. So those are a couple of the things that we want to be on the lookout for are any hitchhiking adults and egg masses. And really, it's the egg masses that can be kind of tricky to see. The adults, if you um, look up images of spotted lanternfly, they're, they're kind of noticeable and they kind of look pretty for some folks. But the egg masses kind of look like mud. And this is especially tricky when you're looking at things like rail cars. On the underside, they blend in very well because there's already mud caked on there. And same with vehicles. So that can pose a challenge. Now, as we get into April, May, uh, typically our spring season, that's when those nymphs will hatch from the eggs. And they'll have four instars before they become adults again, typically in July depending on uh, how many heat units we have built up for the year. Right. And talking about our commercial industry, there's so much trade that goes across state lines, so, so much transportation of materials. And when we're looking at how this insect spreads, you know, we were talking about emerald ash borer earlier. An emerald ash borer can only lay its eggs inside trees. So it only uses the ash tree and it only lays its eggs in the trees. So it should have been much easier to contain, but it escaped because some of the trees got harvested in a quarantine zone and taken out of the quarantine zone, left there, and then they hatched that next spring and spread. Now, when we're talking about spotted lanternfly, like Erica was saying, it looks like a splotch of mud. You know, if we go back to when gypsy moth was um, really being controlled and monitored, they lay their eggs on any surface, inside your wheel wells, on your playground equipment, inside your firewood, and pretty much anywhere. But gypsy moth, at least, had this nice fuzzy egg mass that you could pretty easily see. The spotted lanternfly is really insidious because it's so hard to recognize that egg mass. So one of the things we're encouraging people to do is just, if you're in a quarantine zone, check your stuff. Look around and keep your car clean. Just run it through those pressure washer car washes. If you're going to be going from inside a quarantine area, you know you've got spotted lantern fly where you're living, and you're going to be going outside of that area, now just run through the car wash on your way. You'll have a prettier car, and it'll help to reduce that spread. Now, again, uh, just like we always talk about on this show, there's no such thing as removing all risk. Yeah. All we're trying to do is reduce the risk. 
and to slow it down so that we can keep up with it and it doesn't overwhelm us. Right. I think I think the term you're looking for is uh, mitigated risk management. Ooh, look at you being fancy with the big words. Well, you know, <laughs> that's, that's, that's why I get paid the big bucks, I guess. <laughs> anyway, which is not true, by the way. All right. On another note. I'll tell you what, Karen, um, I know ideally, you know, we can kind of keep our cars washed. We can keep them clean. Those egg masses that basically look like a little bit of spackled mud. Um, yeah, but it's the, 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 the hardest part I think is the season too. Um, having it be winter, mud is everywhere. Might not be as easy to get your car cleaned as it would be like in the spring and summer. Oh, yeah. So that does pose a challenge. And again, like you were saying, you know, we got to mitigate the risk, not eliminate it. So those egg masses, correct me if I'm wrong, Erica, but uh, those egg masses are typically going to be seen like in November. Like so. So as we're at the end of October now going into November, we should start seeing them November, December, January, February. Uh, March and April is when we're looking at the next life cycle when these nymphs start hatching, correct? Yeah, that's correct. But keep in mind that these egg masses do kind of change in color and texture over time. So they'll start off this November, December uh, being kind of smooth, slightly shiny, a little bit of a grayish hue to it. But then as we go on through the year, that outer crust will flake off and you'll actually see the eggs underneath and they form, they're they more brown. They're aligned in rows. So yeah, once again, it depends on the time of year on what you're looking for. So let's make sure we take the time to let people know what they should do if they find it. You know, let's say that they're not in a quarantine zone or they're in a newly quarantined zone and people are, you know, the Department of Agriculture is still trying to get a handle on things. What should people do if they think they've found an egg mass? The best thing they can do at this point in time is report it to their Department of Agriculture. I know in Pennsylvania, they're promoting a lot of stomping. Here in Ohio, we're not quite at that point yet where we're still trying to pinpoint where exactly this insect is. So don't stomp it just yet. Uh, Make sure to call the Ohio Department of Agriculture if you think that you might have spotted lanternfly. There are actually several ways in Ohio to do this. For starters, you might want to directly call ODA. Their number is 614-728-6400. You can also use the Great Lakes Early Detection Network app. Uh, This app can be found at apps.bugwood.org and is very useful for submitting things like pictures. One of the things that a lot of the Department of Agriculture have been uh, running into is that folks are reporting this insect, but they're not sending any photos and they're not giving any location information. So that makes it very difficult to go out and confirm where exactly this insect has been. So when you say ODA, um, you do mean Ohio Department of Agriculture. Yeah. But Erica, what about the extension offices? You know, if somebody just had a question about it and thinks they saw it in that county, I would think that most extension offices would be very open to uh, helping you out and guiding you through the process, maybe even going out there and taking a look. Yeah, absolutely. We can certainly take a look at a specimen and we can definitely confirm if it's not spotted lanternfly. However, to confirm that it is spotted lanternfly, even we have to submit it to ODA for verification. And then they run through their, their protocols for that. Right. Yeah. So, okay. so different options, whatever you're comfortable doing. Um, it is important, though, if you do suspect it, you know, work with us, work with your Department of Agriculture, and let's mitigate this problem, right, Karen? (laughs) Yeah, definitely. And, you know, if you're in West Virginia, it it has been found and confirmed in four counties now. That's Jefferson, Berkeley, Hampshire, and Mineral, all on the eastern part in the eastern panhandle. But we also have a dedicated line for you to contact about spotted lanternfly or any invasive insect or disease sighting. Bugbusters at wvda.us is email address. Or you can call 304-558-2212, and we will repeat all of the contact information again at the end of the show if you didn't happen to have a pencil handy right now. 
or like Dan was saying, contact your local extension office, whoever it is that you commonly work with, and use them to make sure that you're contacting the right people. But if you can go straight to the Department of Agriculture, that will speed the process. Because just like in Ohio, in West Virginia, we also need to confirm it through the Department of Agriculture to get that status of a confirmed finding. They'll come up, they'll examine the site and ensure that it is what indeed we think it is. And it's really important to get those pictures. You know, everyone has a camera in their pocket now. Some people don't, but if you do have a camera in your pocket, take a picture of it and send it in an email or contact uh, your local office so you can get it to them so they can have a visual cue because that saves us a lot of time. If we can definitely rule it out, then that will save a lot of time and we are few and far between here. So (laughs) um, pictures are really helpful for us. And hey, Erica, do you mind giving us an update on Ohio? Yeah, certainly. So Jefferson County was one of the first locations in Ohio to have spotted lanternfly found. It was actually a year ago that it was identified, uh, end of October, in Mingo Junction. So there have been a lot of scouting efforts done in this area and some treatments that have been done. And unfortunately, even though the sites have been treated uh, earlier this summer and fall, we're still seeing some of the adults return this fall. So it's going to be a difficult one to control. In addition, earlier this year, they did identify several populations up in Cuyahoga County. So those very much like the Mingo Junction population, they think were brought in on uh, rail lines that were traveling through infested areas. And as I mentioned before, it's very difficult to find spotted lanternfly on these trains. Yeah. When we talk about infestation and the damages that this bug can do, it's just that it has such an array of different hosts and it causes so much damage in its feeding, but the numbers of bugs that when you have an infestation that come out, we're just talking, it just covers a lot of host plants to the point where it's scary, right, Karen? Just like you were talking about earlier in the show, this insect can reproduce at such a rapid rate and it feeds so much that it basically devastates many, many crops. In this case, we're typically talking about fruit crops. It just goes through an area. And because of the numbers, it's so hard to control. And because of the way it feeds, it can really devastate and ruin many, many fruit crops. Right. And let's talk a little bit about how it feeds. So this is a sap sucker. So it's going to suck the sap out of the plant it prefers woody hosts. And so this is one of the things that terrifies me is that it could impact the timber industry, not just our fruit and nut crops. If their numbers are high enough, they can kill a tree. So we have to keep this in mind when we're trying to identify them and keep them controlled. Their preferred host of all of the flavors out there, they love Tree of Heaven. And we in this area have been fighting against Tree of Heaven for ages and still haven't controlled it. But now, if you've ever needed more of a reason to control Tree of Heaven on your property, Spotted Lanternfly is that reason. So they do love Tree of Heaven. We have not confirmed whether or not they actually need to feed on Tree of Heaven in order to maintain uh, their life cycle, but they will flock to it. And so that's one site that you can use to monitor for incoming Spotted Lanternfly. And you can actually set traps, sticky bands around these trees and around a lot of other things. You know, they like grapes. They love grapes, which is bad for our viticulture industry. They also love black walnuts. They also like hops and they love maple trees. So our maple syrup industry, our nut industry, our grape industry, our fruits They're all at risk right now. And so we really need everybody to pick up the watch and report findings wherever they are. I know that this goes out on AM radio and there's a lot of truck drivers that listen to us. So, hey, guys and gals, we need your help, too. Please check your trucks, especially when you're going through those heavily infested areas in Pennsylvania. I know you kind of have to have a permit right now, but we're just going to ask you real nice, too. So um, please check your vehicles and 
share the word. And, you know, I'm not going to get on my don't move firewood soapbox today, but that again is another frequent way that this insect can be transported. So let's not move our firewood around. Oh, and Karen, there actually was a study that was done recently that was looking at how the fitness of the insect was affected if Tree of Heaven was not around. And they actually did find it can still produce um, and complete its life cycle, even if Tree of Heaven's not there. It seems to like maples. However, if Tree of Heaven is present, that is the most optimal host for them. So they tend to reproduce more. And the other thing, there's still a lot we don't know about it in terms of like, what happens if this insect spreads further south? So currently here in the northern states, we tend to have winters where we get some hard frosts and that kind of limits these. Yeah, this summer when we experience the fall armyworm outbreaks, you know, um, not that they start here, but they were able to get up here earlier and reproduce more, which caused an outbreak type of scenario. And so that is a very interesting aspect that we should that I'm sure people are researching. Yeah, and if we look at some of the data that came out of Pennsylvania, because again, that is the state that's been dealing with it for a long time, and they have a lot of data to share. But things like uh, rose, whether it's cultivated rose or multiflora, you see a lot of nymph action. Um, so May, June, uh, grape, like wild grape and tree of heaven, like Karen said, you see it all the life cycles throughout the whole year. So. If it's not in an egg stage, it's in a nymph stage or an adult stage at all types. So it's a great monitoring plant. So wild grape, cultivated grape, or tree of heaven. I'm just having nightmares. Maple that we did talk about quite a bit, you see a lot of adults in maple trees. And adults, which would then lay the eggs, which as Karen was saying, once you start moving that firewood, you'll move that, that insect from one area to another. But it basically has the ability to reproduce and live just about anywhere. You know, those are all very common plants, some of which are invasive as well. So you got double the scare for Halloween, scary stuff. (laughs) It's it's really (laughs) scary. I mean, this is the stuff of nightmares for me. I'm just picturing this escaping into our uh, forests of West Virginia and just... Uh, you know, I, I can't even I can't even talk about it. It's terrifying. Um, so we know that it's coming. It's just how are we going to deal with it when it gets here? And the earlier we know that it's here, the faster we can take action to control it. So we do need a lot of scouts on the ground. And let's go again over the numbers that people can contact to make sure that if they find it, they're reporting it to the right place. And let me just emphasize again, right now we're looking at egg masses, right? Yeah. So you're basically looking for almost like a little mud spackle. And the way to control that right now is not through chemicals, but just to scrape them off. Obviously, they need to be reported. Yeah, don't scrape them yet. (laughs) That's absolutely true. Thank you, Karen. You control it by scraping. But at this point, what we want to do is monitor and report egg masses either to us or to ODA directly. So I guess I'll I'll just start since I'm talking right now. I am Dan Lima, the Ag and Natural Resources Educator in Belmont County, Ohio. Feel free to call me, 740-695-1455. If you have some questions or you want me to look at something or you want to report something, I'd love to be an intermediary person in this process. But go ahead and Karen, if you want to talk about how to get a hold of you. Yeah, well, you can reach me at karen.cox at mail.wvu.edu. But if you see an egg mass, I would really prefer you go ahead and contact Bugbusters uh, at WVDA.us. That's B-U-G-B-U-S-T-E-R-S at WVDA.us or contact 304-558-2212. That's 304-558-2212. Uh, for those in Jefferson and Harrison counties, you're more than welcome to give me a call if you suspect you have spotted lanternfly. Um, my number is 740-461-6136. Uh, again, you can call ODA. Their number is 614-728-6400 or just use the Great Lakes Early Detection Network app. And again, what we're looking at, like, I'm just going to just go through the life cycle, kind of keep that in mind. So right now we're looking at the egg masses and these egg masses should hatch between March and April. 
I think most of them probably early April is when they're going to start hatching. And then you'll start seeing the nymphs if they're out there. Right. But it get, it's just the numbers that these guys reproduce and the way they feed that causes so much damage and devastation to a lot of valuable crops. Oh, that's something else we should probably talk about is it's not just these insects that we might see. Sometimes they, I mean, they suck a lot of sap and they also produce honeydew. So you might see a lot of sooty mold. They're certainly seeing that out in the Philadelphia area, eastern Pennsylvania. And that's rather alarming to a lot of homeowners when you walk outside and everything is just black. You might also see wasps that are surrounding an area. If you're noticing a lot of wasps, it might be worthwhile to take a closer look. Of course, not too close, but that will give some general ideas of where a spotted lanternfly might be at. So, Erica, when you say honeydew, I mean, that sounds like something. That's a fruit you get at the grocery store, right? <laughs> Like honeydew, that sounds delicious. Um, <laughs> could you tell us a little bit more about honeydew? Yeah, honeydew is a sugary substance that is it's a byproduct of spotted and lanternfly as it feeds. You and, can call it poop. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, poop or uh, frass in the insect world. Um, but yeah, it it tends to have a high sugar makeup. So it tends to draw in a lot of those insects that feed on that sort of stuff. Um, another insect that is commonly known that produces honeydew is aphids. Yeah. So in going back to the way it feeds, sap isn't something that is really, really high in nutrition. So these insects typically just kind of suck a lot of that sap continuously and it just continuously goes through their body so that they can't pull out the nutrients they need. But it causes such a mess. Uh, it just, it, it gets excreted on your car that's parked under the tree, it starts growing mold, it starts attracting insects. And that is kind of a flag that you might have either aphids or scary as that might be, these uh, spotted lanternflies. Be wary of that. And the sooty mold itself can cause problems on the plant. You know, it won't be able to photosynthesize and create more nutrients. And you can see your plant declining simply as a result of not being able to photosynthesize. And again, if you're not in an area where it has spread widely, we're not advising you to treat at this time because we need to confirm it's there before you go and squash them all and make them unidentifiable. And remember to provide photo, at least photos, if not a specimen, as well as the location of where you found it. If we don't have a location, then we can't confirm. Erica, you brought up a very good thing that I want you to go into more detail on before we run out of time. And that is, how can people collect a good specimen? So, yeah, the spotted lanternfly does not tend to move well. They are pretty bulky flyers. So catching adults can be fairly simple. There are a variety of traps, like in Jefferson County, they've set up traps uh, in areas where they suspect might be more at risk for infestation. So we can readily see uh, those insects there when they're present. Um, now, that said, uh, the traps are not 100% effective, uh, and they're still doing a lot of research into what lures might work a little bit better for drawing those in. So even though you might not see any adults in the trap, doesn't necessarily mean they're, they're not there. Um, Right. So we all the time get smashed bugs and smashed bugs are, are very difficult to identify. Now, spotted lanternfly may still be identifiable once it's smashed, but it's better if you don't smash it. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. If you have like a jar or um, like a water bottle. Yeah. All right. All right. So we are out of time. Thank you for joining us, Erica. We loved having you on the show today. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah. Thanks, Erica. Please, if you or someone you know happen to be one of the West Virginians randomly selected to participate in the match survey, I encourage you to take the time to share your health experiences. Thanks for listening to Extension Calling. This show is a collaboration between OSU Belmont County Extension Educator Dan Lima and WVU Ohio County Extension Agent Karen Cox. If you'd like a transcript of this show, contact us at the office. Also, let us know if you enjoy the show by ranking us on your podcast app.